Yeah. So, Mike, I think just to clarify this for folks, I think this is financial life support for banks that are in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the Fed's role is, for better or worse, is lender of last resort. And if you look back at the chart that you put up there, you know, you see that basically the Fed steps in with excessive um, uh, repo support. You know, when the system gets into trouble. So you can see in the last recession back in 08, you know, it spikes and then it comes down and then it basically goes away before we exit the recession, because by that point, you know, a lot of the the challenges that we were dealing with were beginning to resolve. Um, then, of course, you know, at the end of 2019, it explodes out of nowhere, um, which is a signal that somebody was in really big trouble. Somebody was being kept alive by giving by being given huge loans day after day after day, or as you said, Mike, they began to extend them by like a you know week loan or a several week loan or whatnot. But make no mistake, that that's life support keeping a big player or multiple big players alive who would otherwise die essentially without that free money. Um, I just yes. want to share that that we saw this back in 2008. This report by the Martin says. Um, it, Back in 2008, Citigroup was insolvent for much of the time the Fed was flooding it with cheap loans. I think that's what was going on here. You had banks that were in danger of becoming insolvent. And just looking at this chart, Mike, that we we sort of reacted to, and in the first place when we saw this report, Nomura, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, et cetera, received a cumulative total of $8 trillion from this repo program. And you're seeing like Deutsche Bank got over a trillion uh, Barclays got a trillion and a half. Same with Goldman. Uh, Nomura got almost four trillion dollars. So I think there was something going on in the banking system where these major banks were all of a sudden in danger of getting caught with their pants down and maybe having a Lehman type moment. And the Fed came in and just kept them alive with this life support for long enough for the, the, the problem to get contained. And maybe that's the right thing to do for the Fed. Maybe it's not. But the fact that we weren't told about it and how close apparently we came to some major systemic breakdown, I think is really concerning. Uh, yeah, uh, the thing that this shows, you know, we, we, this, we did come very close in 2019 to the entire financial freezing up globally, the entire financial system freezing up globally. And, uh, and you know, who knows what, what would have happened. But this was uh, the first chart, you know, it shows uh, Nomura, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, Citigroup as being the uh, big ones, and Goldman Sachs not really taking that much. But when you do what Pam and Russ did as far as uh, multiplying this out, basically it's taking the amount times the term of the loan. You see that Goldman Sachs had to have capital for a, a very, they had the capital for the longest period of time. Between those banks, uh, they took the least initially, but they held it for a very long time. And that's what this multiplication uh, does. So it, it really does point out who was in the deepest doo doo. <laughs> and it was Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, and Nomura. But right. it's, well, it, it also may be instructive, too, in terms of why the stimulus that was flooded into the system the next year in 2020 was as gargantuan as it was. You know, it might have been using the, the pandemic as a bit of a smokescreen to be able to feed a lot more support um, into these institutions to make sure that they you know, remained alive through it all. Yeah, it also um, uh, shows that uh, there <clears throat> one of the things the Fed had said that this was uh, due to tax season and end of the year and these banks uh, needed currency. But the thing is that Nomura, Barclays and Deutsche Banks are trading affiliates of foreign banks. And so uh, are they, Pam and Russ say, are we really expected to believe that the US corporations uh, are holding their quarterly tax payments with the trading units of foreign banks? (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, Because these foreign banks needed the bailout. And so this smokescreen basically lie that the Federal Reserve came up with uh, to try and calm the public down. Oh, it's just because uh, they owed taxes. No, there was something, a real serious meltdown going on here. And, uh, you know, in closing, uh, they say that the Senate Banking Committee and the House Financial Services Committee, it's time for them to haul the relevant parties to into a hearing uh, and, you know, Find, get to the bottom of this. What was this? And uh, why is this stuff happening? 
uh, it, what it shows is if this is happening, it shows that the banks are not stable, that they are taking on far more risk than they should be taking on, that these, uh, th these fiduciaries, fin trusted financial institutions that have a responsibility are being, uh, they're, they're pushing things to the edge because of competitiveness. They have to try and, and out profit each other. And uh, that competitive competitiveness leads them to walking this razor's edge of, you know, global financial meltdown, maximum profits. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this last time I was on, Mike, um, and thank goodness for, you know, real gumshoe investigative journalism like the kind being done here by Pam and Russ Martins. Um, back in 2019, we knew something was going on under the under the sheets there. I mean, we knew that that the, the numbers that were flooding into the repo market every night, um, you know, were gargantuan, like nothing we had ever seen before. Um, but we weren't being told anything and, and it was being put off as like, ah, oh, everything's fine. Well, now we're actually beginning to get a sense for the order of magnitude of the trouble that a lot of the country's biggest banks were in. Um, so Mike, looking at the charts here, like how much is the, the cumulative total that, that these banks received during that period? Well, it's pretty gigantic, but before we get to that, I just wanna show everybody uh, a chart of the uh, repurchase agreements. This is the Wednesday level. So the middle of each week, they, the Fed reports the Wednesday level. And normally this is intrabank lending. So everybody needs to understand what repos are. And a repurchase agreement is uh, uh, one bank needs some cash. They uh, need to borrow. They put up a bond and they agree to repurchase that bond, usually in 24 hours, the next day. Uh, and uh, you see them going along here and then the Fed just completely stepped out of the repo market and the repo market was all basically the free market controlling it, the banks determining uh, what the rates were and stuff. And then suddenly the Fed jumping back in. So you can see the scale of it from the Federal Reserve reporting. Uh, but, you know, Pam and Russ Martins, they, they're uh, talking about uh, the normally these loans are one day repo loans. But very, very often they're rolled over day after day after day. So basically it's a 24 hour loan that gets paid off 24 hours uh, from then by financing it with another loan <laughs> for 24 hours. And uh, so there, uh, during this period of time, the Fed added 14 day, 28 day and 42 day loans. Uh, so if a, they, their example here is let's say trading a trading firm took a $10 billion uh, loan for one day, but that same day took another $10 billion for 14 days. The 14-day loan for $10 billion represents the equivalent of 14 days of borrowing $10 billion or a cumulative, cumulative total of $140. i am not sure that um, this is, I'm, I'm not sure whether, I, I mean, maybe this is correct way to look at it. Maybe it's not the correct way to look at it. Uh, there's 10 billion outstanding at all times uh, on this loan because it's getting paid off. You know, if it's a, if it's the equivalent of 14 days of borrowing, 10 billion dollars of uh, of those 24-hour loans, those 24-hour loans. If there was 14 days of borrowing those loans, they get rolled over day after day after day, and so it isn't 140 billion. Nevertheless, you know, there's, there's different ways of, of looking at this accounting wise. Uh, it is shocking. It, even without the multiplication of looking at it, uh, this other, using this other method of cumulative total of if they took this $10 billion loan that was for an extended period of time, how does it compare to a 24 hour loan for the same amount? Is it cumulative or not? Uh, it, Without that multiplication, it's still totaled four and a half trillion dollars, which is an enormous amount. This is a, a huge fraction of the U.S. currency supply. The, the, uh, the Fed, remember, the Fed invents this currency when they uh, make the loans, and then the currency gets extinguished when the loans are repaid. Uh, now, if you uh, do this multiplication by accounting for the number of days that the loan is outstanding, uh, then you're talking about just under $20 trillion. 
that's close to the entire currency supply. <laughs> <laughs> you got to look at M2 or, or uh, MZM or, or these different aggregates of the currency supply. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke. And you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.